I'm reading from Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. I know that whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. Say it forever. forever. Nothing can be put to it or added to it, nor anything taken from it. And God doeth it. Say it, God is doing it. Why? So that men should worship before Him. That which has been is now. Say it, that which has been is now. And that which is to be has already been. And God requires that which is past. Then I want to read another... Uh, part of my text. And if the righteous are scarcely saved, that is by believing only, and only because of what Christ did for them, since we had absolutely nothing going for us at the time, as far as saving ourselves is concerned, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Let us pray. Father, we thank you today for your word, that you will move by your Holy Spirit in our hearts. Lord, this is where we need you. This is where we want to meet with you, is in our hearts, in the very center of our life, in the very core of our being. We don't want you on the outside. We want to know you on the inside. Hallelujah. Job said in chapter 19, verse 20, My bone cleaveth to my skin and to my flesh. This is how wasted away he was at this time. He said, and I am escaped with the skin of my teeth. Now just keep that in mind because I want to use that. We, we often hear the expression, and this is where we got the expression, people get the expression, I just made it by the skin of my teeth. <laughs> in other words, they just barely made it. In 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 18, and I want to continue this message from the message that I began last Sunday. That's why I'm using the same text from Ecclesiastes. In 1 Peter 4.18, Peter is only commenting on a scripture in Proverbs 11.31. He is not quoting it when he said, Behold, the righteous shall be recompensed for what they've done in the earth. Much more shall the wicked and the sinner be rewarded for what they've done. Right? <laughs> well, let's look at this for a minute because oftentimes this is misquoted. Solomon is saying here that if those who are saved are going to be judged for their works, how much more shall God judge the wicked and the sinner? Who are the righteous spoken of here except the believers in Jesus? Amen? Amen? The believers in Jesus are the only people on this earth who are righteous. <laughs> Not those who go about doing all these good uh, acts of humanitarianism. If you don't believe in Jesus, then you reject Jesus. And to reject Jesus is what condemns us. The only thing that saves us is not our own goodness or our own righteousness, but believing on His goodness and His righteousness. I know that I was naked and undone when I met the Lord, and I was scarcely saved, but only because I believed that Jesus could save me. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. This is what it means if the righteous scarcely be saved. doesn't mean that the saints are, are just maybe going to make it into heaven. No, we know that we have eternal life, the Bible said. And we know that He is the one who saved us and that He is our righteousness. Paul spent a whole chapter or more on it in the book of Romans that the righteous are those who, like Father Abraham, believe in the Lord. <laughs> Amen. The righteous are those who believe in the Lord. Hallelujah. Solomon is saying here that if those who are saved are going to be judged for their works, what does that mean? I'll tell you what that means. Paul wrote about it in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 when he said that the righteous, the saved, the, the believers are going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. 
And their works are going to be judged. Their works are going to be tested by fire. But they will not be lost, but their works may be burned up. Yet even if all their works are burned up, they will still be saved. Yeah. <laughs> they will still be saved. If you're righteous, you're going in the rapture. So let's, let's clarify some things here. Peter refers to them as the righteous. Well, who are the righteous? Those who believe. Hallelujah. <laughs> All the righteous are secure in their faith that Christ is able not to scarcely save them, but as Paul wrote in the book of Hebrews, that he is able to save those to the uttermost. Say it, to the uttermost. Yeah. Who's going to be saved? Those who believe God to save them to the uttermost. Hallelujah. Jesus is on the butterfingers, as we've said in times past. He isn't going to slip and drop you. He's not. He, he, we can trust him to hold on to us. Amen. Amen. Said Jesus is able to hold on to me. You see, the work salvationists need to get a God who is big enough to save them all the way. <laughs> And what do I mean by that? They don't believe that their salvation is secure yet. They believe that they can still fall out and lose out with God, and so they're not trusting, really, that they're fully saved. Because if you're fully saved, then it's just like Jesus said, my sheep know my voice, and they know I'm able to keep them. Hallelujah. And I give them eternal life, not probationary life, and they shall never be lost. Amen. They'll never be lost. Never. Say never. 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 All right. This is why they're always trying to add something to their salvation. We need to conform our thoughts to the facts. How many believe in the facts? Yes. The facts are God's promises. The promises of God. Jesus said, I have given to them eternal life and they shall never perish. Amen. Amen? Amen. Now, in Ecclesiastes... He said, I know that whatever God does, it shall be forever. Nothing can be added to it. So why are people always trying to add to the Word of God? Why do they always add their own theologies? They become like the Pharisees who begin to add all their own ideas. And when they add their own ideas, they negate the truths of God. They negate the truths of God. It's just like Jesus said to the Pharisees, he said that they violated the law of Moses by, by being so uh, adamant in keeping the traditions of the elders instead. You see, the, elder, the, the law of Moses said that a, a man shall honor his father and mother. And so if he has something to help them with or to support them with, but denies it to them by saying, well, I'm going to give it to God instead. There's a lot of people who are denying their very families and their children and their wife because they're so-called giving everything to God. You can't give everything to God and deny your own family. You can't give everything to God and deny your own family. You owe your wife to love her as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Hallelujah. Are you giving yourself for your wife as Christ loved the church and was willing to die for it? He said, even as you nourish and cherish your own body and take care of it, so Christ does the church. Yes. And so, what is our job? Those who are married need to be devoted to their spouse, and those who have children need to be devoted to raising their kids in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord and spending time with them. Spending time with them, giving themselves to their kids and to their wife. Hallelujah. And to their husband. Why? Because of the fact that Christ did that for us. And those who give themselves to others are those who are truly giving to God. Yeah. Jesus said, as much as you have not done it to the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. You haven't done it to me. But if you have done it to the least of these, then you've done it unto me. You see, whosoever uh, gives a cup of cold water in the name of a disciple to someone that's thirsty shall not lose his reward. Our love is not measured by how many times we go to church or a Bible study or to a prayer meeting, but our love is measured by how we devote ourselves to others. Say it to others. These are, there's only two commandments in the, in the New Covenant. Only two commandments. 
<laughs> that you believe on the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and that you love one another. Hello. Believing on Jesus and loving each other. Amen. You show your love to God by the love you have for your brother. He that says he loves God but doesn't love his brother is a liar. How can you love God whom you've not seen if you don't love your brother whom you have seen? Amen? Amen. So we see here that we need to let God out of his box. We've narrowed God down to going to a prayer meeting or going to a church service or, or going to a Bible study and then measuring people's lives and their salvation by how much they do, by how much, um, by their attendance or their faithfulness to a, a church function. But it's bigger than that. You go to every church function and sit next to a man or woman and still not love them. That's right, amen. Yeah. It's not church attendance that measures your love for God, but it's your love for others that measures how much you love God. Hallelujah. We need to let God out of the little box that we put Him in, a box of our own limitations and our own designs. We need to quit trying to add to and take away from the words of God. Those who deny the fact that they're eternally secure in Christ are denying and calling God, calling Christ a liar. For Christ said, I give them eternal life and they will never perish. Hallelujah. Jesus gives us eternal life. And when we have eternal life, then it's unending life. It will not fall by the wayside. It will not pass away in the next six or 12 months. But God is able to keep us all the way to glory, to fill us all the way with his spirit and to quit acting in our own natural nature and to start acting in our divine nature, which is given to us by the promises of God. Why was the ten spies not able to enter into the promised land? Because they didn't believe the promises of God. No, it didn't say because they were drunkards or fornicators or murmurers or complainers. They could not enter in, the book of Hebrews says, because of what? Unbelief. Unbelief. Say it, unbelief. Unbelief. The ten spies didn't believe the promises of God. They didn't believe that God was able to take them in and give them the land because they were figuring everything out in their carnal thinking by looking at the size of the giants and the high walls and everything else. Are you looking at your circumstances? Are you looking at the devastating circumstances you live in? Are you looking at your present circumstances? Then get your eyes off your circumstances. You've had your eyes on your circumstances forever. It's time to get our eyes on Jesus. Amen. The only thing that will save you is faith. Amen. True faith. What's faith? Trusting in the promises of God. I trust Jesus' promise that he will not drop me. He will not lose me. I trust in his promise that he is able to keep me all the way to his appearing, that he's able to save me to the uttermost, say it to the uttermost, and that I will never perish. And I will not let, not let go of my confession of faith in his word, but his word said I will never perish, so I believe, and I know because I believe that his promise is true, I will never perish. My hope of glory is not my perfect walk or my being able to perfect everything in my life, but my faith is in what? The promises of God and God alone, for only then am I a partaker of the divine nature. It's through believing His promise that we live, are able to live holy. It's because of His promise that we're able to not fall. It's because of believing His promises Hallelujah. That we act and live and walk and think and talk like Jesus. Hallelujah. Give the Lord a round of applause if you believe it. Job said, my bone cleaves to my skin and to my flesh and I'm escaped with the skin of my teeth. You know, Saul of Tarsus, we may say that he was scarcely saved. He was headed at breakneck speed toward hell. 
And if it had not been for the mercy and the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, Saul would have died and went to hell. But thank God Jesus stepped in just in time. And Paul could have stood up later and said, look what the Lord has done. He took a murderer. He took a terrorist who was terrorizing God's church and he transformed me into a saint. Yes, Saul of Tarsus was just scarcely saved and that by the grace of God but once God had saved him he knew that God could keep him all the way hallelujah he said I know whom I believed and I know that he is able I know he's able to keep that which I've committed to him a good sad day what had Paul committed to the Lord his very life his very body his very soul and his very spirit hallelujah and he knew that when Jesus appeared he would be like him because he would see Jesus Hallelujah! as he is what makes us righteous seeing Jesus seeing Jesus is our righteousness believing Jesus is our righteousness focusing on Jesus is our righteousness is it any wonder that the early apostles went everywhere from house to house and in the temple every day preaching Jesus? They knew the only thing that could save a sinner from his sins was Jesus. They knew that the only thing that could pick, make a person righteous was receiving Jesus. Righteousness is instantaneous to the man or woman who believes on him even though they have done nothing good. They have done only evil for all of sin to come short of the glory of God. But the moment Jesus comes in all your sins are immediately gone and now God looks at you as if you'd lived a righteous life you are righteous in his sight you are born of righteousness I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus hallelujah and you need to get it through your thick skull that Jesus is your righteousness Jesus not your own performance Jesus is the hope of glory hallelujah Hallelujah. My expectation is to be glorified when he appears. Why? Because I know that Jesus is my righteousness. I can't have confidence in my own performance, but I have confidence every day, 24-7, because Christ has already made the perfect performance. He completed it. Hallelujah. His performance is perfect. And his performance is imputed to us the moment we believe on him. Just like Adam's performance of sin was imputed to the whole human race and they were all born sinners. So Christ's performance of righteousness was imputed to all who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ is the last and final Adam. There will never be another progenitor of humanity. Only those who believe on Jesus are born again into the kingdom and the family of God our Father. Hallelujah. Jesus. Job was scarcely saved, but he was still saved. Amen? Amen. And healed completely. He's, he had lost everything except his wife. Yes, sir. And all she did was find fault with him and complain about him. Yes. He said, I'm escaped. I got nothing left. I'm only escaped with the very skin of my teeth. <laughs> That's, that's all I'm left with. No, that wasn't all he was left with. He still had Jesus. He still had the Heavenly Father. He still had a faithful God who was able to restore him to perfect health. Is that not what he did with the human race when he saves us? Is that not what he did with you and I? We, were, we barely had anything left to live for, but Jesus stepped in right on time and saved us. Hallelujah. We were scarcely saved, but thank God we were saved. Saved. And we are saved. Jesus. Jesus is our expectation that when he appears we'll be glorified. Amen. And to all that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. <laughs> Hallelujah. From whence also we look for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who when he shall appear, you and I are going to appear together with him in glory. How many believe that? Yes, amen. Jesus will not just appear in glory, but you and I are going to appear right there with him because that's where we already are.
We're already there, but it's, we're not manifest up there yet. But when we're manifest, hallelujah, we'll drop this shell, this earthly shell, and we'll, our true self will be manifest where it really is in glory, hallelujah, with Christ Jesus, and we'll look just like him. For we're going to see him as he is. How many believe you're going to see him as he is? Hallelujah. No wonder John said, Beloved, now are we the sons of God. Now, not next week. Mm hmm not a million years from now, but now we are the sons of God. Yes. You see, people have to settle that in their heart right now, that they're already born into the family of God. Hallelujah. When you're born into the family of God, you're in. Hallelujah. Thank God we're in. Yeah. Say it, I'm in. Yeah. Yeah. We are now the sons and daughters of God. And even though it doesn't yet appear what we're going to look like, we know that when He, when he appears, we're going to appear with Him. Yes. Looking just like Him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just like him. Hallelujah. That's what it's all about. In 1 Corinthians 13, they try to say that tongues was done away and that the gift of knowledge has been done away and all these other things have been done. No, they haven't been done away. They misunderstand what done away means. He said, now we prophesy in part, in fragments. We know in part, in fragments. But when He appears, when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part shall now be complete or in full. Hallelujah. Now I speak in partial tongues, but then I'll know every language. <laughs> now I know Christ partially. I see through a glass darkly, but the, it won't be looking through a dark glass when He appears, but we'll see Him in the full radiance of all of His glory. And when Moses saw the glory of God, he looked like God. His face shone like God. And we're going to reflect the glory of God in His appearing. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Because we trust in that which was done. And what that which was now is. And that which shall be has already been. As I began to touch on it last week, it's already recorded in the book of Revelation, something that hasn't even happened yet, but yet it's written as history as if it's already been done. Amen. It's already a done deal, amen? amen. We read about those who through the tribulation are going to stay true to our Lord Jesus Christ and will be saved. Hallelujah. They're going to resist the mark of the Antichrist and they will be saved. Hallelujah. They, they haven't even maybe been born yet or if they have been, that time have come, hasn't come yet. But we know that when it comes, they've already victorious. They have already won the race. They already won the battle because they believed on Jesus. They believed on Jesus and would rather let their heads be cut off than, deny, than to deny Jesus. They've already done their martyrous act. John already saw the souls of those who are martyred under the altar for Jesus Christ. It's already done. They've already gone to heaven. They already have their glorified bodies because we read about the new heaven and the new earth and the first heaven and the first earth passing away. It's the future recorded in the past. That was recorded 2,000 years ago and it hasn't even happened yet but in the mind of God it's already a done deal. It's already a done deal. Hallelujah. Stand to your feet and lift your hands. You see, if we could look at our lives in God's recordings, we would see ourselves already standing on the sea of glass, glorifying the Lamb of God and our Father, who sitteth upon the throne, who lives forever and ever, who is and who was and who is to come. El Shaddai, the Almighty, our Provider. Hallelujah the one we receive all our nourishment from the one in whom we are rooted and grounded the same one who nourishes us and builds us up hallelujah it's Jesus from beginning to end it's Jesus it's his glory that's our glory it's his sanctification that's our sanctification it's his righteousness that's our righteousness it's his holiness that's our holiness hallelujah it's his praise that's our praise for he, our Lord sprang out of Judah and Judah means praise hallelujah and all of heaven and all of earth are going to praise the Lion of Judah who has prevailed over the devil over our sins over our iniquities over our diseases over the curse 
Hallelujah, it's Jesus all the way. Say it, Jesus, it's you all the way. It's you all the way. You're my beginning and you're my ending. You're my first and my last. You're the one who started me and you're the one that's going to complete me. You're the one who began me and you're the one that's going to perfect me because you are my perfection. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. We await the glorification of our bodies. We await your appearing, Lord Jesus. When we leave this veil of tears, when we leave this turmoil and this chaos, oh, but until that time, let the Holy Spirit brood over the tova over the chaos and the confusion and the darkness and raise up new souls and new saints that will come to know Jesus and that will do the works of Christ and turn many from darkness to light, who will turn many from unrighteousness to righteousness, who will turn many from unbelief into belief and into faith and trust in you, O oh God. We trust in you. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, glory be to God. Glory be to God. How many are trusting in the Lord today? How many are trusting in the Lord today? How many are trusting in His might? How many are trusting in His power? Oh, yes. Let me tell you, the only way you'll be saved is to believe on Jesus. And once you believe on Jesus in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead and you confess Him with your mouth, you will be saved. It's not by joining the church. It's not by doing this or doing some other thing. But the only way a person can be saved is simply to receive and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. For as to as many as received him, to them gave he the right and the privilege to be the sons of God. Even to them that believe on his name. And what's his name? Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Jesus.